Hi, I'm Diane McGarry with Drake at Arts. With me today are co-host Tom McGarry, poet Alice B. Fogel, and ASL interpreter Elizabeth. Alice was the New Hampshire Poet Laureate from 2014 to 2019. She is the author of five poetry collections, including Interval, poems based on the Bach Goldberg Variations, which won the Scheffner Award for Music and Literature and the New Hampshire Literary Award. Another poetry book, Nothing But, a series of indirect considerations on art and consciousness was published last August. And she is also the author of Strange Terrain on how to appreciate poetry without necessarily getting it. Among other awards, Alice has been given a fellowship from the National Endowment for the Arts and her poems have appeared in many journals and anthologies, including Best American Poetry. She teaches reading and writing workshops in a wide range of areas, works one-on-one -on -one with students and learning with learning differences at Landmark College and hikes mountains whenever possible. Alice, we're so glad to have you here with us today. How neat about nothing but what was just getting published. That is so cool. Thank you. Thanks, it's great to be here too. So, can you tell me a little bit about um, about Nothing But, how difficult it is to put a book like that together and how long, it, what the process is and how long it takes? Um, so this, this book is um, a series of poems inspired by um, abstract expressionist art, individual pieces of art. And um, so um, in a way, having the art there, even though I'm not trying to describe or explain the art, having it there really feels like cheating because it just makes it so much easier to, to write something there. I, I'm being inspired by the forms and the colors and the texture, the shapes, the light and the shadow. And so um, what I did for a few years actually was um, look for abstract paintings for the most part, some other kinds of art, but mostly paintings that I just, that that did not say to me, oh, that looks like uh, anything. If, if I could say that looks like a landscape, that looks like a tree, that looks like a ship, I, I wouldn't have used that piece of art. I wanted it to stop my mind. Huh. The flow of the, the, the you know, the, um, that natural flow of thought that's constantly going, the stream of consciousness, I wanted it to stop it. And um, so I would sometimes kind of borrow from some of what I was seeing in the painting or the title of the painting and just take it from there. And what I was trying to do was um, mimic in language the way that um, abstract art transports us. Um, which you really can't put into words. So I'm, you know, I'm sort of playing with a medium that's contradicting itself in, in a sense. Um, so the poems are not that, uh, probably not that easy to take in. They're not telling you about something that happened to me or describing things so much as really they're, they're representing consciousness in, in a sense. Um, it took a, it took quite a few years to write the poems, and um, and then more years to um, really put the book together as a book. I'm glad we got our interpreter back. I'm sorry we lost her for a minute there, Elizabeth. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, so I'm sorry that kind of distracted me. So it took you a while. Do you have anything from the book that you'd like to share with us today? Um, sure. I'm, um, I, I'll show you the cover first. This is absolutely gorgeous. Painting. I'm so glad. If you can, I'm trying to get it away from the light because it's kind of shiny. It's, it's, a, it's a painting um, by Robin Tedesco that um, she often does. I'll show you some more of them later. Um, she often does these things that really look pretty cosmic to me, like wow. something that, you know, might have gotten sent back from the Hubble telescope. Um, and that really appeals to me. And I also am really drawn to artwork that looks like something that just got dug up out of the ground, just some things that just look really natural and elemental in a sense. Um, so actually, is it okay if I share my screen? Oh yes, yeah, please do. Okay.
Um, let's see. So can you see poems and art from nothing but? Is that what you're seeing now? They are. Okay, good. Another beautiful picture, another cosmic picture. I love it. Yes, um, I'll tell you about that in a minute. First, I'm gonna just read you the, the quote from William James. Consciousness is in constant change, a series of indirect considerations. The only breaches that can well be conceived to occur within the limits of a single mind would be interruptions, time gaps during which the consciousness went out from, from 1892. So, um, hold on, this, Elizabeth, you've, the ASL interpreter is <coughs> in your hands. So can you get um, higher in the screen for us? Okay, let me, let me see. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Liz. I just want everybody to be able to hear. Can you see that? Uh, the words, the, if you get rid of your name, it will um, put it right up there. Ah, there, if when you put them in front of your face, we can see them. I'm not seeing what you're seeing. I know. Uh, you're Alice, you are fine. I'm talking to Elizabeth, the interpreter. Okay. Okay, go so on. So these time gaps or interruptions um, are, were what I'm looking for in the art. So this particular painting is by Martha Rhea Baker, who is um, an encaustic and oil painter who exhibits in Santa Fe. Um, and this is probably my favorite of all of the um, artworks that I used, if I could choose one. Um, and I'll show you what um, the poems look like. They're in frames, just like the artwork and spread about um, in the frame, most, most of them. And I, I see these phrases as kind of brush strokes and um, pieces, little fragments of thought. Um, so I don't have really good images to share for the most part, this is, but this is a small image from this painting by Kathy Burge. Uh -huh. She exhibits in Hudson, New York. So when I read the poem, you might be able to see where I'm getting some of my images from, but it's really my mind just taking off from there. Sounds great. Um, I am going to have to interrupt myself for one second to just let my dog out right here. Sorry. <laughs> All right, torn. We have to love and admit that there isn't always a story, though surely a story could stumble out of here unrecognizing as a wanderer from a blizzard, snow blind, who dies otherwise within sight of his home. Surely the out of focus plots an ambivalent arc, a physics of light and ice in which figure the twisted and turned testaments of glint and sheen, a green whose green is not rhetorical, a white that is everything but autobiography in truth is absorbing, builds suspense, tells what else, and if and then and again, subtle hints we rough in like concrete, attention unwinds us like a tail. We see now what follows us inside, why our eyes hurt when we look away. Wow. So these poems are almost all in this first person plural as a kind of collective consciousness. Um, and really they develop over through the book, a kind of a conversation about what is perception, what's illusion, what's reality. 
what is thought. And the artwork is kind of um, bringing us into this place of, um, we're transported to this place where we can think about um, reality in this different dimension. So when I say there isn't always a story, that that is about abstract expressionist art, um, but it's also about you know our lives too. That's really beautiful. Thank you. This is another one of Robin Tedesco's pieces. She often does these multiples, and there so there's these five different paintings um, that go together. And so I put them in five boxes, the poem. Ah, cool. Um, to kind of mimic the way that the, the world of the art is contained. It's, in, it's, it, it's contained just like our bodies contain us. Um, and so the only time when I didn't use these frames are when I was writing something from first person singular from my actual point of view, or if I was writing about a piece of art that didn't have a frame, like a mobile or a, a three dimensional structure. So I'll read this one. You'll adjust. Where are you going? Stay with us, stay awake. Don't go making inroads or assumptions. Use the map provided. Where are you going to look it up? It's all ridge, all whirlpool, no subclause. We can't even begin to describe how it moves. All the time it acts like it's still. Where would you go if it's time out of mind? A kind of temporal immortality to paint and more paint, to almost taste it when you try to speak through a crack in the reasoning, to what hinges, what sieves the mirrored valley as peered at from above, how far down it goes, how deep, the definition, its fact, the leap. Don't go to geology to ledge just go to the level of paint. It shouldn't even be possible to refuse what you see. Wow. These are pretty esoteric. <laughs> yes. Um, the, the while back, I wrote a book of poems that you mentioned when you introduced me. Um, based on Box Goldberg variations and using the structure of the variations and the tone and the mood of the poems. I mean, as the, as the variations, as um, voices for the poems. And um, I was way into this project with the art before it even occurred to me that I was doing almost the same thing with the art that I had done with the music. Um, basically using a crutch of somebody else's devising as a gift to be inspired by. Um, this one doesn't have the piece of art to go with it. Some place. If it was the true world, we could never live here. We could never survive our own anxieties. But because it's only an actual, for a while we can, still it throws us to go all devoid of ourselves and thoughts like that. As long as we keep winning, we cast our votes for our own oligarchy, saying we'd be crazy not to. But sometimes, Secretly, don't we ask when I don't think, am I not? And look at the glorious forms. We can change, we claim, or we can love making up everything as we go, clinging to weather patterns 
make or break us. How literal is that thing we undermine here? Is what we fear afraid of us? We are hungry and we have imaginary friends, good ones. We haven't come yet to the point where we lose our patience with the trivial, the black and white, anything but the throes of decency and meaning. Okay, we aren't hungry now, but we will be, we think. Excuse me one more time. Yeah, I was wondering how long your little pooch would stay outside. Yeah. I'm sorry, he's barking at the neighbors. Oh, I thought he might be freezing. It's chilly out here. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, I went to the dump this morning when it was one degree. Right. <laughs> it was already up about 12 degrees from what it was earlier. Would you like me to keep reading some more? I would love, I love your poems. They're incredible. So yes, please. Okay. And I do want to just say to people, if you have questions, I'm happy to stop in between and, and hear your questions. You can put them in the chat or you can raise your hand and um, we can see that you will have a question. Thank you, Alice. Ellen Raleigh is a, an artist in Massachusetts, I think. And even though this is such a tiny little thumbnail, because if I blow it up, it pixelates too much. Um, you can see how striking the blues are in it, how, um, how really um, deep the color goes. Blues. Because we're tired to death of blue, how it is forever, as if benignly, suggestive of depths of as if it had heft infinitude because it is always about some conceptual sky as if there were virtue it beckoning the mortal to blame or abandon time we want something more of blue want a kind of blue that bears the limits of walls a blue imbued with brazen bricks, flat, blackened and not beholden to emptiness, contextual in its own frame. We want blue blurred, blue blatant, blues blunt and blared to bash our brain into. It's scarred substance, it's thick skin and heavy heart broken, horizoned, so much the matter of its own making and blindly self-referential like us, not even trying to, as if it could brush past the fact, its burden of blue. I apologize on Cosmo's behalf. That's all right, we're talking about the cosmos here. <laughs> I'm gonna ask you a, an earthly question in relation. So growing up as a little child and actually into my teens, most poems had a straight form, but you're, you've thrown that out the window, <laughs> using space in your poetry um, in a whole different way. Could you talk a little bit about that? Because that's not what I usually, I shouldn't say not what I usually expect, but it's not the vanilla I grew up with. It's more likely. Uh -huh. um, you know, every artist likes to come from convention and tradition and then put their own spin on it. Um, I, I love all the aspects of poetry. I love the sounds of it and the breathiness of it. I love that we can visualize things. I love the movement of it. And, um, and what it looks like on the page is also a beautiful thing about poetry. It doesn't look like other things that we read. When, when, usually when we're seeing a poem, we know it's a poem. And so um, 
but usually like you're saying they line up on the left hand side and not on the right that's usually the form um but i like the shape of the poem to almost um imitate what it's about or the way that we think like the ways that our minds pause so the space becomes a kind of punctuation yeah um, and time, there's time lapse, there's suspense when you come to the end of a line and you have to travel through this space before you pop over to the next line and, and get to finish a thought, or it may change a thought when you get to that new line and new information comes so that there's this recursive quality of um, reading a line, getting in more information, having to read the line before it again, so that you keep on building um, thought and sound and meaning as you go. So to me, um, the structure of a poem is really worth playing with and thinking about. Well, it's also, as you read them, you're using the convention of left to right, the next line left to right. But you could also do, for instance, time of blue that bears the limits of walls blackened and not beholden, contextual, blue blurred, blunt, it's thick horizoned and blindly self-referential as if it could. Mm -hmm. That's just, I mean, taking different parts, even, and then going back up and, and, you know, doing it as columns or a different way. There's the freedom to do that in the way that you've structured this. Mm, that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. You could, um, you can find new ways to put the phrases together. Yeah. Yeah. At first, I wasn't sure I liked the way you break up the phrases with a pause or a visual space after you know short phrases. But the more you read it, and the more I read along with what you were reading out loud, the more I said, yeah, that's kind of cool. And then especially when you said that's the way we think. It's also the way we speak when we're trying to find the right word. So uh, at first I didn't think I liked it, but it really grew on me. And now I, I think I like it a lot. <laughs> huh. Yeah, I mean, sometimes when, when we speak, we run thoughts together, despite the fact that there might be a period there if we were writing it out. And other times we break up our, our thinking. So it definitely is, is playing around with some of that motion, that, that stream of consciousness and speech. Playing around in art, isn't art supposed to be really serious? <laughs> <laughs> it's seriously fun. Uh, <laughs> thank you. So this is one of the poems that, about every 10 or 12 poems in the book, um, there's one that is really, coming from me and um, trying to examine what, what this whole project is for me, why art matters so much to me, um, why I um, love being transported. Um, so these usually start off with I instead of we, and they don't have a title and they don't have the frame. Pretend I asked the physicist and the mystic, what is the nature of reality? And they said, we cannot answer this question with answers. What if we were meant to ask the art galleries to arbitrate electromagnetic actions as they orbit an exact consciousness? One mind flirting with the sublime, one atmosphere, tinged with hail and tornadoes. And what about the equations? Will we falter when they fail to be as elegant or worse, yield only abstractions? Heavens, no, practical applications. Then will we consider under cover of mass and matter if in fact, whether in spirit we've obeyed or defied, the given forces. What we've had are gravity's other favors. 
how what is set down can lift us anyway, upwards of ourselves. If we might have been capable of reaching entirely different conclusions. Thank you so much for interpreting for me. I love seeing that. Um, Jenny Thomas is another painter that uses encaustic and oils and um, also exhibits in New Mexico. And she has a series of these, um, what she calls gray matters paintings. And in playing off the title, I come up with grave matters. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> because the thought is so like a body, a possible way to remember if we could climb would be to climb on the rough rocks of the sky. When our eyes get encrypted with cravings we can't depend on, the creviced scripts wet with blood and dew. Hold on, we're still thinking, the mind's Dagger is a dagger, always there, the way the moon is there, even when we can't see it or see it through our double vision. There is a light, but not that which is not heavy. Here is its shadow, a lit lamentation over loss. There is that. Gravity always falls away from it. Gravity is what freehand makes a perfect circle flattened to ellipse, what makes branches and birds wondrous, what makes the stab of sun for the vine the opposite force of attraction. Will we ever wake up in the undreaming without want, body cut loose from mind? Half the time we fall for half the time, because it's less solidless than it is effort toward happiness is why we climb. This, um, the mind's dagger is from Macbeth where Shakespeare says um, that a dagger in the mind is as dangerous as a dagger in the hand. Um, and if you think about how you, you can create present, immediate emotion when you think about something, when you remember something, or when you um, project a thought that you might do something or something might happen, you know, the anxiety that we feel contemplating something that might happen, or the joy or the grief we feel when we think about things in the past. It, it's really true that the mind's dagger is a dagger. <laughs> it you know, affects us like, like the present. So as the book goes on, it gets um, into more and more almost religious realms. So it, all of it is pretty spiritual in some sense, but it gets into some religious kinds of questions about um, reality and uh, what it is that we yearn for in, in our spirits as well as our bodies. Mm -hmm. This one's called Undone. Still today, blinded at the crossroads, the desert monks might recognize for what it is another impenetrable prayer. Inside the hot tents of their robes, the melting candles of their bodies promise, there is nothing that isn't abstraction. Once we are maddened enough, wicked flames in risen heat smolder invisible as their skin, released under their own cognizance, ardent and losing patience, 
they might with only a flicker of irony decide that all answers are the answers to all questions, or that it's legit if the redemptive blip is subtle, a pitched pebble to the skull, that we want it to be a holy conflagration, its bright streaks arcing in the dark, a breakage in the act of happening every time we don't look again. I'll just read a couple more. Um, I like to play around with pronouns a lot, but it, you know, just to make it maybe a little bit easier when I say it in this, start this um, poem with the word it, which usually needs to refer to something. I'm thinking of the absence, um, the absence in the painting, what it's not depicting, what it's omitting as far as uh, literal reality. Um, and I guess I'll detour for a second to say that while this kind of art is considered non-representational, I think we could say that it does represent something. It doesn't represent concrete objects um, or landscapes or people, but it represents a kind of um, being in the world, the ways that our, um, that our eyes are tuned to light, um, light and darkness and shadow, the elements in the world, um, and maybe just consciousness itself. So the title of the book, Nothing But, is kind of playing off of that. It's, it's, um, it's really anything but um, non-representational. It's just a different kind of representation. Absence of here. It bleeds through like tinted walls beyond a fog. It's a rune for art, the unreachable part between rose knit and ashes bark. When we heard in God's image, we could not but for mirrors see what that might be, that it might be this. Now, what if we could empty to it Take it down out of awe and abstract, a vow of doubt, that we might always follow the gauze weave of its curtain, its fold and fray, because it is so useful, this useless grace of material that sources the interrogative trace of the code for the thing itself, the precision of its teeth, such thingness, that absence that bleeds through by the truth of its own authority, this laying on of hands makes palpable the infinite field of consciousness on a four cornered board, the longing we bring to it, the dream we have of it, the fingerprints we leave on it after we probe in our sleep, it's flesh and blood. Wow. And this last one is called Full of Life. When we say, when I leave this earth, we mean when I leave this place I am and try to find anywhere where there are no unmarked graves. We keep thinking we're seeing where maybe there are none, shades of condensation, the old horizontals where fresh verticals of dirt scrape away to granite and glare, a kind of feral dusting of lichen coats the history of the ones buried in a hurry and left. Now we can't help but doubt and double back 
make new assumptions about old assumptions, take on purpose everything personally, and then we just want to cry. If we knew what makes us conscious, if it was of Adam or of Adam, if particle or God, would that change our minds? Every time we try, we try to give up the ghost of gravity. We get so unbalanced, we're ashamed. And what are our options? Go down under humus like a seed or be lifted into air by heat. We're afraid to tilt beyond the painted limits of the frame. We have a feeling we are the frame. That's the last <laughs> that I have for you today. Um, I'm going to stop sharing the screen. Thank you. There's so much consciousness and philosophy in what you write. It, that's very, it is very philosophical, I think, yeah. So for the poems you read today, they all fit on one page, which is really great for this kind of online presentation. But that must have been a very conscious choice on your part, or could you speak about that a little bit? I don't think any of the poems in this book are more than a page, although they might not have, you know, worked in in this format. But um, but yeah, I did want to choose ones so we could that we could see. the The first time I did a reading from this book, I think it was the first time, um, and I had some different paintings to show and the poems. Um, and a big argument started happening in the chat. Um, and there was a host um, who was reading them. Um, half the people were saying, we wanna look at the paintings while she's reading. <laughs> and the other half were saying, I wanna look at the poem while she's <laughs> reading. And the host had to finally say, please stop arguing <laughs> about this. She'll decide what, <laughs> what you're gonna look at. <laughs> but what was really interesting to me was that by the end of it, almost everybody wanted to see the poem when I was reading because they felt that the poem was beginning to be its own piece of art to look at, which wasn't what I would have necessarily predicted. That's very cool. So, so I'm happy to answer any, any questions or just field comments if anybody has any. Well, Cosmos thinks that, um, I mean, one of the people thinks that Camus' favorite was, you'll adjust. <laughs> <laughs> so we have adjusted to his coming in and out. Mm, he has finally settled down. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't had a chance to look at the, um, the chats. <laughs> I wanted to um, just comment for a little bit for a minute about uh, Victoria's art, um, which is not abstract expressionist. It's definitely showing things in nature. We were looking at this before. I don't know if you all saw this, but we were looking at it before. Um, and, but she does kind of do a little bit of abstraction with some of the, the flowers and the water in ways that I think are are almost showing the truth or the reality of those, um, those things in nature even more. She's getting it at our feelings about what we're seeing, not just the thing itself because of the way she used color and brush strokes and, um, and showed the movement and things. They're, they're beautiful. Is she coming back again after this? Um, no, her art gallery will be on YouTube by Monday. But, um, it's interesting in a way you're both doing the same thing only using different vehicles to do it hmm. yeah that may be true of um, so many different kinds of art oh, yes <laughs> we're all coming from someplace um, and trying to um, put our 
interpretation or understanding on what we perceive. So how did you get drawn to being a poet? Um, uh, when I was a little kid, I um, just loved all the arts and I pretty much did everything that I could do. I played music, I danced, I, um, I wrote, um, painted, but um, I don't know. I don't, I, I'm not even sure that poetry would have been my favorite thing. Maybe it was just the, I was shy and it was just something you could do in your room by yourself and nobody had to see it. Um, and uh, the materials are cheap, you know, it doesn't cost much pencil and paper. Um, and I just felt like I could do almost all of those things in a poem if I, if I pushed language as far as I could get it to go. Hmm. Pushed language as far as you could get it to go. Can you talk more about that, about pushing language? <laughs> Um, a lot of people think that, you know, there's this thing we say um, about uh, words fail me or, or um, you know, that you can't express things in certain, you can't express some things in words. And I, I guess I don't believe that. I mean, you know, surely there are experiences that we have as, as humans on this planet that are nearly impossible to articulate. And there are many experiences that don't need to be articulated in words. But I do think that we, that it's not language's fault. I think it's our our fault that we just haven't found a way to use it huh. um, fully. Because language is more than I mean, language is so primal. It's not just um, letters on a page or sounds um, or movements. You know, as we're seeing in the interpreter. Um, there's something way deeper than that going on. And yet at the same time, as you're articulating that, I'm thinking about how um, Inuits who live in the snow have so many words for snow. Mm -hmm. You know, here in New England, snow, snow, you know, but there are so many different types of snow, so many different types of ice, mm -hmm. but we don't have the words to articulate that. And even some languages um, don't pull in other languages into their word pool, yeah? Um, mm -hmm. like French doesn't. Fr the French will make up their own word before they pull somebody else's in. Or, mm -hmm. And um, Icelandic is thousands of years old, you know, and it's put together, the words are put together, are made up, made up of to articulate something. So it's really, I wonder how much of the articulation and the language comes from not just how we use it and what our experience is, but, but how we build it and how we even think of sounds and what's behind each sound. Mm -hmm. And then we can't even think if we don't, you know, there, there are different ways that we think because of the way that our grammar is constructed in the language of our choice or of our childhood. And different uh, time tenses make us think differently about time. Um, just like there's supposedly 50 words for snow, like what about how many words we could use for love? The different kinds of love, all of our experiences. And actually English is one of the most plastic and complete languages on the planet because we do take words from everywhere. And we create words, we make up words. Every day I read the New York Times briefs and it tells me about a new word that was just used for the first time that day. Oh, wow. <laughs> I'll have to start looking at that. Huh. I, I mean, I just love how language is so alive. Yeah. Tom, I'm thinking about this person you told me a while ago, and I hope that it jogs your memories because you'll be more clear than I will be about um, a person who studied language. And he grew up with a language where um, there wasn't a way to talk about, there wasn't conditional, I think. 
Right. So it's a wonderful uh, uh, talk somewhere uh, on YouTube. I think it was a TED talk. Uh, and I believe the language was Hmong, which is the language of people in Laos or I think in Laos, but it doesn't have any subjunctives. You can't say, if this happens, we can do this. It's just very focused on the present. And that was very helpful to his parents who uh, emigrated, came to the US, had to work very hard to establish a good life. And then they wanted a better life for him. And they were pushing him to be like a doctor or a lawyer, or, you know, study English, do well. He hated English. <laughs> but the older he got, the more he got into languages. And so now he studies language <laughs> and especially the differences between languages. So uh, in his situation, it's useful to have the subjunctive to consider if I do this or if this happens, then this other thing is possible. And he's also compared uh, the language of his parents to other languages like French, which apparently has two forms of the subjunctive. And I've never, I meant to look that up, I never did. But why would you need two, two forms of the subjunctive? I mean, I speak English and that, that's good enough. But of course, uh, the language we grow up learning and then other languages we might learn in our lifetime uh, can limit us in terms of what we think is possible or maybe even expand our horizons to think, oh, well, maybe I can, you know, think of things this other way. So that happens, of course, in language, uh, probably also in science and art. So that's what I remember about the TED talk. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I mean, so in terms of expanding or limiting our thinking, right? If you don't have an if then, that, that kind of, it is a, a barrier. I think there's a lot of emotion mixed up in the in the conditionals, you know, and we have all kinds of crazy tenses that we don't even, you know, don't, we don't even think about, but like, um, I will have wished that. <laughs> I mean, you can, you can just build up all these conditionals and they get kind of wistful because, <laughs> because they're all uh, things that could happen or could have happened, but um, haven't happened. Yeah. I mean, we, we do have lots of that in English. We just don't think about it. when you study French or Spanish, you, you, you study all about the subjunctive, but, um, and then it makes you realize that we do have that kind of thing. We just don't um, think about it in those terms. No, we just take it for granted. <laughs> yeah. Alice, um, pivoting back to this interplay between your poems and the paintings, I'm wondering if you have had any contact with the artists beyond getting permission to use, use their, you know, the prints, but um, how they've reacted to your poems in, in response to the painting. Well, thanks for asking about that. Um, so a few, just a few of these um, artists that I use are people that I know. A couple of them are really close friends and some of them um, are, I'm friendly with. But most of them were people I didn't I didn't know at all. And so when I was working on the project and it was com coming along, I um, wrote a letter to and sent it to everybody whose addresses I could find. Um, and I did hear back from several, quite a few. And some of them we ended up corresponding, you know, with each other and sort of be becoming friendly. Um, some I never heard from. Um, and I can't seem to, and I, I tried again when, when I had the publisher for the book, I wanted to let them know that this had happened. And so I got more responses then, oh, can I see the poem that you know, goes with my painting? So I did send you know, all of those to people. And um, you know, as you can imagine, everybody likes knowing that somebody's paying attention to something that they did. So they were all pretty tickled about it don't know exactly what most of them would have thought of the poems. One of them, the one actually, that first painting that I showed you, that was my favorite one, she wrote back and um, after I sent the poem and she said, oh, you got it, you got something about me. It, Cause it said something about, um, we wouldn't care if color was more important to us than anything else or something like that. And she said, yeah, that's, that's me. So that was really fun to, to be able to do that. 
You also have done some collaborative pieces, right? Didn't you, um, did you do a piece with a, a harpist or am I thinking of someone else? Um, I don't think I did anything with a harpist, although somebody may have played at a reading, but I've done a lot of other stuff like this. When I was the poet laureate in New Hampshire, I made a project of a dozen New Hampshire artists and matched it up with a dozen poets who chose the artists. Um, and then they, and they just created something together. And then we exhibited it. It traveled through the libraries around New Hampshire. How um, cool. That was, that was really fun. Um, I mean, it's, it's always great to, to find people to collaborate with one way or another. It's really important because it enlivens the, the art. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think for me, the whole, um, my inspiration to make any kind of art and to be a writer was that I just wanted to join the party. <laughs> I just wanted to like, oh, look at all these amazing materials out here in this world. I wanna play and I wanna be part of this and I wanna be part of a community that does this. That's very neat, Alice. <laughs> And you are, you are part of the community that does this now. Well, and thank you to people like you who, who host us. Appreciate it. Well, thank you for your wonderful, wonderful poems. They're really incredibly beautiful. Thank you. Does anyone else have any questions or anything they'd like to ask Alice? Well, thank you very much, Alice. This has been delightful. And we'd also like to thank our donors. Here you go. Oops. Yes, thank you. Marianne Dornice Goldman, Lois Welber, Lou Shutter Web Design, Anonymous, Diane's Song, Cultural Investment Portfolio Project from the Massachusetts Cultural Council, and local grants from the Bill Ricca, Drakett, and Tewksbury Cultural Councils. If you'd like to be a donor, please email us at drakettarts at gmail.com. We'd also like you to know that Drakett Arts is again implementing our Cards of Appreciation and Love program to honor our many faithful and dedicated healthcare workers. Please send us cards that say thank you to our healthcare workers by February 1st, and they will be distributed at Lowell General Hospital over Valentine's Day week. These can be store-bought cards that you've signed or ones you've made and decorated or posters that you've decorated with drawings, words of love and appreciation, but nothing more than eight and a half by 11, a typical sheet of notebook or printer paper. Send the cards to um, Cards of Appreciation and Love to Drake at Arts, at 55 Emerald Drive, Drakeit, Massachusetts, 01826. Or we can arrange to pick them up. Just email us at drakeitarts at gmail.com. Help us make sure that those who work so hard for us know that we care and that they're supported. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here today. I've really loved this. Thank you, Alice. You've been wonderful. And Elizabeth, thank you very much. <laughs>